In this video from Learn Electrics, we will look at loop impedance, why you need to know it and why it is one of the important steps in showing that an installation is safe to be put into service. The sort of questions we are asked have included, what is an impedance? What is external loop impedance? And what is system loop impedance? And what does this tell us and how can I apply loop impedance to my installation work? Before we begin, we must understand these two words. The first is resistance and this is measured in ohms. Here we are interested in the simple resistance of a piece of copper wire. The copper will show a fixed resistance to the flow of electricity through the wire as electrons collide with the copper structure. It is measured with a DC voltage around 4 volts and just fractions of an amp and it is a dead test. The second one is impedance and this is again measured in ohms with a slight difference. In an AC alternating current system the supply varies in a plus and minus direction in a sine wave pattern. Several other things can now affect the flow of electrons such as inductance and capacitance from other cables and circuit components and these are live tests with the circuit energised. Impedance values will vary depending on what else is happening in the installation. With most installations at 50 cycles per second, resistance and impedance are almost the same value. A dead test for resistance can be by multimeter or a multifunction tester MFT. But live tests for loop impedance must be by multifunction tester MFT or a dedicated loop tester. Do not test live loop impedance with a multimeter. This will damage the multimeter and may harm you. We can begin with a reminder of the three types of earthing system in popular use. This system shown here is TNS. The earth and neutral are in separate conductors throughout the whole system. There is the more modern TNCS system where the earth and neutral are combined in the same cable up to the property and at the point of entry to the building they are separated into an earth and a neutral conductor. And lastly there is the TT system. An earth rod is installed by the supply company at their transformer and the customer must provide their own earth rod at their premises. There is no copper connection between the two earth rods, just the soil. When measuring loop impedance, we should always begin by measuring this at the point of entry to the consumer unit or distribution board. We want to measure the impedance of all the external parts of the installation, from the property to the substation and back again. At this point, we have a situation where maximum current will flow during a fault. Imagine that we have a fault between line and earth at the consumer unit. This fault has directly shorted the line and earth together and a massive current will flow. The fault current will flow from the point of the fault, the red arrow in this case. Current will flow from the line terminal through the fault to the earth terminal and back to the earth point at the supply transformer. But that is not the end of the story. The fault current then flows through the supply transformer, back through the main fuse and meter and back to the point of fault. Then it will go around again and again in a loop. This is the earth fault loop. The current that flows, typically hundreds of amps, is called the prospective fault current or PFC. Prospective meaning how much current is possible in a worst case. At some point, this massive current blows the fuse or operates the circuit breaker. The current stops flowing and the installation is put into a state of safety awaiting repair. And we need to know that this will in fact happen. And we do this by measuring the impedance path that the fault current will take and we call this impedance path ZE. Z for the impedance and E for external. ZE is something that you must be able to measure and it is recorded on the test certificates. We said that ZE is an impedance that can be measured in ohms and ohms law can be used. These two triangles show that voltage divided by current 
will give us ZE in ohms. Each earthing system has a maximum recommended impedance for ZE, the outside part of the installation. For a TNS system, this is 0 0.8 ohms. Using the Ohm's Law triangle, 230 volts divided by 0 0.8 ohms gives us a maximum fault current of 287 amps. For a more modern TNCS system, the maximum ZE is just 0 0.35 ohms. Doing the calculation again, up to 657 amps might flow during a fault on a TNCS system. With the TT system, things are very different. A TT system can have a ZE of up to 200 ohms, and this will only yield a fault current of 1.15 amps in this case. Of course, ZE numbers could be lower in all scenarios, but we are quoting here the maximum figures suggested to be within normal expectations. Let's look at what this means to a 6 amp MCB if there was a fault at the consumer unit. Again, we are looking at worst case scenarios. A type B breaker needs 5 times its rating to make it trip almost instantly. 5 times 6 amps is 30 amps of fault current. A type C 6 amp MCB needs 10 times the rating, which is 60 amps. And a D type needs 20 times 6 amps or 120 amps in order to achieve near instantaneous tripping. What does this mean for each of the earthing systems? For a TNS system, enough fault current will flow through a 6 amp breaker to operate a type B or C or D breaker within the required time for safety. For TNCS, the same is also true. The 6 amp MCB will trip safely for types B, C and D. But a TT system does not have a big enough fault current to cause operation of any circuit breaker. And this is one reason that RCD devices are always installed as additional protection in TT systems. But this is discussed in detail in another video. Look now at a 32 amp MCB. It needs the same trip current multiplier, 5, 10 and 20 times the rating, but now the current is that much bigger. With the ZE maximum figures, a TNS system at 287 amps will cause instant operation of the B32 breaker, but not the C-type or D-type. For the TNCS system, the fault current is sufficient to trip the B and C types in the required time, but not the D type. And alas, the TT system at 1.15 amps will never trip any of the breakers. To the TT system, it's just another ordinary day. Let's make the numbers even more critical now. ZS is the whole system loop impedance and should be measured at the points of use in the property. ZS is made up of ZE plus R1 plus R2. And because there is now more copper wire in the circuits, the resistances will inevitably increase and make our conditions worse. If a significant earth fault should occur in the house, as shown here, what would be the earth fault loop impedance now? Fault current will flow from the point of the fault, and let's say it's a water heater. Through the water heater casing to the earth cable, out of the property to the earth point of the substation transformer, through the transformer windings and back to the property and it returns on the line to the water heater. The earth fault loop impedance path is now ZE added to R1 plus R2. And we've just said ZE plus R1 plus R2 makes up ZS, the loop impedance value of the whole system. The on-site guide will give us the maximum measured ZS values for different fuses and circuit breakers in table B6. If the actual measured using our multifunction tester is less than the figures in the on-site guide, then we can be confident that the breaker will trip in the required time for safety. If we use a lighting circuit as an example, a 6 amp MCB is to be installed. The ZE is 0 0.35 ohms and R1 plus R2 is 2.4 ohms. Adding these together, we have 2.75 ohms for ZS. If we now look at the maximum ZS values for the 6 amp types, we can see that at 2.75 ohms, the actual ZS 
is well below the maximum of 5.82 ohms for a Type B breaker and just below the maximum limit for a Type C. Both the Types B and C 6 amp breaker will operate correctly. However, the Type D does not meet the criteria. Go on now and consider a 32 amp socket circuit. It is still a TNCS system and the ZE remains at the maximum of 0 0.35 ohms. The R1 plus R2 this time is 0 0.66 ohms. So ZS must be 0 0.35 plus 0 0.66 which is 1.01 ohms. Looking at the table for 32 amp breakers we note that with an actual ZS of 1.01 ohms the circuit is just below the permitted maximum of 1.1 ohms for a Type B. But the Type C and D are both outside the specified range. Making comparisons like this will help you to design and install circuits safely and correctly and comply with the wiring regulations and the building regulations. There are two loop impedances. All the external parts called ZE, the external loop impedance, and the whole system is called ZS, the system loop impedance, and this is made up of ZE plus R1 plus R2. ZS must be compared with the data tables in the on-site guide to ensure compliance with the requirements for safety and protection from electric shock. The actual measured value must be less than the maximum permitted value in the on-site guide. And every MCB or fuse rating and type will have its own permitted maximum values. There are three types of BSEN 60898 circuit breakers and there is an easy to understand relationship between types and ZS. Type B breakers will have a permitted maximum ZS as shown in the on-site guide table B6. Type C breakers will have a ZS of half the type B value and type D breakers will have a ZS of half the type C numbers. If the actual measured value is or will be greater than the permitted maximum then steps should be taken to reduce the actual ZS value. Ideally we should calculate what the actual ZS will be at the design stage before we begin the installation. It is far easier to change circuit parameters before they are built and this is less costly too. There are several ways to reduce the actual ZS. Reduce ZE but ZE is generally fixed for that property. Reduce the length of R1 plus R2 but the position of the point of use is usually fixed. Increase the cable size to reduce R1 plus R2 but usually only practical at the design stage. Or change the permitted maximum ZS. A smaller rating circuit breaker will have a larger permitted ZS. For example B32 is 1.1 ohms but a B20 is 1.75 ohms. And that's it for this video. We hope that you've enjoyed it and that perhaps you've put a little more knowledge into your mental toolbox. We will leave some links in the description to other videos that are related to this subject. Thank you for watching this video. It is very much appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. Here are some tips on getting even more information and help out of learnelectrics.com. At your web browser, enter learnelectrics.com into the search bar, select learnelectrics.com from the choices offered and the website, as shown, will open up for you. You now have a couple of choices. You can search for a help item or any video by entering a keyword into the search bar on the right. Click on return and all the help files and videos with that word in the title will be listed for you. They will be shown with a short description and each video listed will have a link shown that will take you directly to that exact YouTube video. Or you can browse through a list of all the available items and videos. To do this, click on the LE logo on the top left of the home page and all our items and videos will be shown. There will be 10 items shown on each page and at the bottom of each page is a page selector, page 2, page 3, 4 and so on that will bring up the next 10 items or videos in the list. And don't forget 
You can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel. Don't miss the next one. Once again, thanks for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.